it's always a problem. How do I get in? How do I get experience without a job to give me experience? And you've basically given us the roadmap for that. Yes. I mean, that's, that's fantastic because it, it's, it sounds like what you're giving everyone who's watching is a way to break in without making the mistake. And I think a lot of people make this mistake. They think they have to leave their job and be unemployed to get a degree or get a cert before they can actually break in. That's absolutely not the case. I, I, I am vehemently opposed to that. Yeah. I think I think this is one of the, cybersecurity is an amazing industry. And, you know, I have found I found gold and I want to share it with literally everybody um, because it, it's not outside the reach. And, and I'll I'll tell I'll tell you this. You can cut it in or out if you want to. Um, uh, I I didn't get accepted into college. When, when I when I graduated high school, I got turned down to go into college. But tell me, how do I do this? Give, give me okay. give me the give me the pause. And, and, and here's and here are here are Neil's top three things. Neil's top three things are hey everyone, it's David Bumble. I haven't done one of these in a while, but I've been asked so many times to talk about the top certifications to get if you want to get into ethical hacking. And to help me answer that question, I've got Neil. Neil, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, David. It's good to be here. So Neil, tell us a bit about yourself. I mean, you've told me a little bit about who you are. We've recently met, but you know, give us the sort of the quick overview of your experience and why you, you can talk about the subject. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and thanks very much for having me on. It's 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 an it's an honor to be here. My name is Neil Bridges. Uh, I've been 20 years uh, plus in, in the cybersecurity space. Uh, 10 years of that I spent uh, doing offensive hacking for uh, the United States Air Force uh, as part of the National Security Agency. Um, I've built the first uh, functional training unit for uh, for Air Force Cyber, basically training all of the hackers that uh, ha have gone to the, to the NSA to go be hackers over at the NSA. Um, since being out of the Air Force, I've had uh, multiple uh, gigs as a as a uh, building up a pen testing of red teams uh, with Fortune 100 companies. I've been a, a consultant for Pricewaterhouse Coopers, one of the the, the largest uh, consulting firms uh, uh, in the world. Uh, where I led a lot of their uh, their their incident threat management uh, out of the Midwest, and I've built uh, multiple security operations teams uh, for, uh, for for Fortune 100 companies. Uh, spent five years as a SANS instructor. Uh, I'm a notable author. I've done appearances on Bloomberg, uh, and and I've, I've spoken at numerous numerous conferences and and by invitation guest uh, for for a lot of the, uh, the 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 vendors and vendor events inside the cybersecurity arena. Yeah, I mean, you, you didn't you speak at Black Hat? Is that right? Uh, I, I did speak at Black Hat. I've also spoken at um, uh, DEF CON. I've spoken at uh, uh, B-Sides, spoken at a lot of uh, uh, smaller events and things like that. I've been asked to, to come and consult with the FBI, um, spoken at, um, uh, been, been keynote for a lot of vendor events, uh, such as Proofpoint, Carbon Black, Splunk, and things like that. Yeah, I mean, that's really great. I mean, one of the, th when I was thinking about this today, I was thinking one of the great things that that I really like about you is you're not just working on like the black hat side, if you like. So you're not, or the, you know, the penetration testing, you're not trying to just break in. You're also working with companies, you're working with the NSA, you're working with government organizations to protect themselves. Is that right? That That is. And, and one of the things that, that you know, I've, I've always been into hacking and I've always loved the, the offensive side of things. Um, one of the things I quickly realized is, is everybody loves the offensive hacking. It really is the, the cool, sexy about what it, about our industry, about what it is that we do. But, but at the same time, you know, the, the, the thing that, that helps most organizations is the ability to protect those organizations from hackers. And, and there's not enough of those unsung heroes. And so I give a, I, I give a lot of credit and I try to spend a lot of my time working on, the defense of uh, networks and putting that hacker mindset to work to, to defend networks, to help blue teams, to train threat hunting teams, to help uh, try to protect a lot of these large organizations because we're lacking that mindset on the blue side um, because everybody wants to gravitate over to the, the ethical hacking uh, piece of things. Now, I want to bring the level down on this video because I want to give people who are starting out a path to, to get into this industry. And as I said to you earlier, I want to show them how they can get to where you are, you know, learn your knowledge. So first thing is, what's a blue team? What's a red team? Can you just explain some of the basics? And, you know, you've mentioned that term. 100%. So um, when you're talking about ethical hacking, when you're talking about the ability to uh, look for vulnerabilities inside of systems, and whether those systems are people or computers, 
uh, buildings, if you're talking about physical penetration testing, um, when you're looking at those systems, a red team or the red side of, of our cybersecurity industry is oftentimes looking for ways to, to find those vulnerabilities and then to turn those vulnerabilities into access, if you will, for the bad guy. Um, whether that's in the term of, like I said, a physical penetration test where you're looking for access to a building, or whether you're uh, you know, penetrating a computer trying to gain access to, to systems or data, that's oftentimes what we refer to on uh, the red side or the offensive side. On the blue side, those are really the uh, the network defenders, and I'm not just talking about the uh, the IT folks who are sitting in the NOC or the network operations center doing uh, you know routing and switching and firewalling. Um, when we think about blue teamers, we're really talking about folks who sit inside of a security operations center. These are your incident responders. These are your threat hunters. Uh, these are folks who are um, uh, you know looking at your alerting and monitoring on your uh, on your SIM system or your security information and event management system, something like a Splunk, uh, Q Radar, or a Logarithm, or something like that. Um, these are the guys, and and I and I equate this. And when I talk to to CISOs and CIOs and CEOs on the regular, you know, I, I equate the blue teamers. You know, those are your frontline soldiers. Um, those are the folks who are who are on the battlefield on a day to day basis, actively fighting uh, the adversaries um, that are attacking corporations. Uh, they're looking at alerts. They're running down malware. They're you know hunting for for the adversary inside of uh, inside of your your corporate network. Um, and, and so while red team is very sexy and everybody loves to do red team because we've um, uh, we've we've created kind of a, a hype culture around the coolness of hacking, exactly. it truly is the frontline soldiers of blue team um, that that make a company tick. And I mean, what about jobs? Because I mean, at the end of the day, you want to be paid to do this stuff. Do you see that there's more jobs for the blue team, like for companies, or are there more jobs for like offensive stuff? There are way more jobs for blue team. As a matter of fact, in, in, in every organization, the amount of blue, you know, the ratio between blue jobs and red jobs um, is almost 10 to 1. I've, I've built some of the largest uh, uh, security operations teams, um, you know, in, in, in the United States of America. And, and I can tell you that even on some of those teams, you've struggled to have one or two pen testers engaged full time. Um, pen testing is often remanded to a lot of the consulting agencies. So like your PWCs, your KPMGs, your EYs, maybe an Accenture or something like that, if you're if you're familiar with Accenture. Um, and, and sure, they do a lot of engagement, but you're going to be as part of that, that uh, consulting ecosystem. If you have aspirations of working for a Microsoft or Google or, or an Amazon or an Apple or something like that, of course, they, they do employ pen testers and those, are, those pen testing jobs are there, but those are also very, very hard to, to, to get to and to achieve. Is it possible for someone to start out um, as a blue team member and then move to the red team once they you know learn more skills and get more well known 100 percent, absolutely that is one of the biggest um uh things that I, I i mentor folks on all the time and, and as a matter of fact it is not uncommon and one of the things that i talk about when we talk about teaching teaching students and when we talk about bringing people into this career field is um you'll get it an, an individual who's come right out of college or maybe even doesn't even have any college has come out of high school with some some experience or some some um you know maybe a handful of certifications or they've they've taken videos like yours david or you know other videos on youtube to to learn about cybersecurity or ethical hacking but they can only either get like a help desk job or maybe like a very very junior level security analyst sitting on a blue team looking at alerts on a on a sim They'll come in, they'll see their first penetration tester, or they'll see their first penetration test uh, inside that company, and they'll immediately gravitate to that and be like, how do I get into this career field? You absolutely, they, you can absolutely go from security analyst on a blue team, you can go from help desk. Trust me when I tell you that I've seen people go from uh, construction workers and business degrees and law degrees to penetration testing as well. Um, and, and, and there's, you know, there's no end to where you can get into this career field um, as long as you've got the mindset, and you've got the heart to do it. Okay, so now I've got to ask you a number of things because you mentioned a few <laughs> things there. Firstly, do we need degrees? And then the big question I, asked, I wanted to talk about is certifications and which certifications. So do I need a degree, first thing? Secondly, do I need certifications? And if so, which certifications would you recommend? Do you need a degree? No. This is the biggest thing that I love to debunk. I've had, uh, I've talked to several recruiters, um, 
I'm going to give you an opportunity to cut something here if you want to. No, go um, for it, yeah. Just go for it. Um, I, I've had several recruiters that I've interviewed on my stream before. Um, we've talked about the the way the industry is going when it comes to, uh, to to certifications versus degrees versus, you know, all the other versus experience. And the industry as a whole is very much moving away from uh, the, the need for, for degrees. Um, as a matter of fact, if you start to look at a lot of the job descriptions, especially in some of the higher technical skilled roles, especially on the ethical hacking side, on the incident response side, on the threat hunting side, um, you'll see that a lot of the job descriptions are changing from four-year degree or certifications or some combination of those and experience. And so that's a huge shift. As a matter of fact, if you look across the tech industry, you'll see companies like PricewaterhouseCoopers, KPMG, EY, they're all starting to drop their four-year uh, degree requirement to start to bring in more talent who may have a vocational degree, may have an associate's degree, may not have any degree, but some certifications, or even may not have any certifications and has just been able to prove themselves through, you know, heart and the interview process that they're capable and qualified to be sitting in that role. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going to get to the certifications in a moment, but I, you mentioned you've got a Twitch stream. Can you you know, at this point, tell us a bit about, you know, what are you doing on Twitch and what's your, you know, how do, how, do, how can people contact you? Because I'm, I'm assuming you're on Twitter, places like that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we, we run a, uh, a Twitch stream called Cyber Insecurity. Um, it's, it's just cyber underscore insecurity. Uh, if you go to twitch.tv, um, we, we stream every Monday, Wednesday and Saturday, uh, 7 Central in the U.S., uh, Central Standard Time. And uh, we regularly have... Um, uh, guests from all across the industry uh, appear on the stream. We've had the chief strategist from Anomaly Threat Intelligence appear on the stream. We've had the chief strategist from VMware Carbon Black appear on the stream. We've had a uh, former uh, uh, two-star general who ran uh, Cyber Command uh, appear on the stream. And we talk about everything from red team to blue team. Uh, ha you know, we, we, it's tailored for whether you're tactical level, whether you're at the CISO level, whether you're trying to get into CISO. We've done uh, on-stream resume reviews. We've done on-stream report reviews, actual pen testing reports. And we've talked about how, you know, pen testing reports get interpreted at the CISA level, at the board level, and how you can tweak your writing so that... Uh, uh, so that you can you can write better for the folks who are going to read your audience, and so it's a very well rounded uh, stream that kind of seeks to try to do a lot of of on stream mentorship um, for for a lot of folks in the industry as well. We cover the latest and greatest in, in news and topics, and we bring industry experts on to do that. Um, so so cyber insecurity on uh, uh, on Twitch, and you can follow me on Twitter at uh, it junkie. So I'm going to recommend that all of you you know go and follow. Uh, Neil's Twitch stream and you know follow him follow him follow him on Twitter but um, Neil just going back now so mm -hmm. I'm 17 years old or I, I wish but if I <laughs> <laughs> let's let's say I'm 17 years old or oh my God, man here we go we're going 17 again <laughs> yeah there we go <laughs> we can we can dream okay what do you, what do you recommend I want to get into this field I want yeah. to perhaps go red team blue team whatever yeah. degree you saying don't do that or get a certification or just try and get experience because I just, I'll just i just preface it with this. I've seen guys bash degrees. I've seen guys bash certifications. So what would you advise me? I'm trying to get into this industry. I might be young. I might be old. Like you said, you, it's great to hear the stories of like construction workers getting into this field. But let's say I'm trying to break into this field. What would you recommend I do in 2021? Absolutely. So in 2021, um, let, me, let me make one thing clear. I'm not bashing a degree at all. You no. don't need a degree, but you know, I've got folks that I mentor that are going for a master's degree. I've got one guy that I mentor that's going for a PhD in cybersecurity. They all know that they don't have to do that. As a matter of fact, they're not going to make any more money by simply going for a master's degree or a PhD. It is about personal goals and personal objectives for them. And so what I would tell you if you were 17 years old is if you want a degree, if that is a passion of yours to have a degree and to be able to have that piece of paper, then I absolutely think you should achieve one. But don't ever feel like you have to have one to be inside of this field. And I think those two, those two points are vastly different. What I would tell you if you want to break into this field, um, HR folks and recruiters are looking for folks who have hands-on experience. And so, you know, if, if you're familiar with, you know, like what David talks about when he does some of his demonstrations of, of, of ethical hacking or, or um, you know, any of the other uh, uh, you know, technical stuff that he does, building your own home lab, doing your own um, 
uh, type of, of think tanky type stuff is absolutely critical. Make sure you're going out there and you're participating in capture the flags, especially on the ethical hacking side. Um, David, I don't know if you want to mention ctftime.org, uh, but that's a, a great website where people can go and find a, a huge central location of, of capture the flags that are out there. And you don't have to have any level of knowledge. You can literally just start there and just start that learning process and just keep track of the CTFs that you do. Um, go out there and participate in the communities and the discords, make your name out there, start to network with folks like David and, and, and other peers in your organization. And then as you develop that learning skill, yes, start to pursue certifications at the same time. And when you look at these certifications, um, look at certifications, and, and, and I may sound a little cynical when I say this, but you have to realize that there are certifications that help you get knowledge and make you smarter. And there are certifications that help you get past the gatekeepers in HR. And I've spoken frequently on the gatekeepers of HR. And, and it is something that, that, that is a reality. We all have to acknowledge that HR is a gatekeeper in this industry. And so I'm not a fan of CEH. I've taken multiple CEHs throughout my career. Um, I won't bash EC Council, you know, openly, you know, like this, but it's, <laughs> it's a, you know, you know, there are definitely better things out there, but it is, it is a, a language that HR speaks that I think is an inevitable reality. OSCP, um, you know, is, is a good cert, but, um, you know, there are better certs out there and there are better hands-on labs out there, but it is a language that HR speaks. And so I think when you look at certifications, you have to divide your time, money, and effort up between the ones that are gonna help you get past HR as a gatekeeper and the ones that are actually gonna make you smart and marketable in this industry. And I think that those two things are vastly different in this industry. I think that's a great points. I mean, so to to give me first certification if I'm starting out, what should I do first? What should I do second? I mean, is there kind of a path or a roadmap of certs that you would recommend? I mean, some guys have said just go and do OSCP, but to me that seems like too much of a jump for a lot of people. It is a jump, and and I don't necessarily recommend people to jump straight to OSCP. The people who say go straight to OSCP are the people that know that um, OSCP is a gatekeeper for some of the some of the most prestigious organizations that are out there that are looking for penetration testers. But if you're looking to get in on the ground floor, um, you know, you can go take something like the the INE, the the former uh, eLearn security uh, uh, penetration testing student or uh, junior penetration testing course. And those courses will not only give you a certification, but they will also give you the hands on skills uh, and, and cognitive knowledge that you need to not only get past the gatekeepers, but to also make you incredibly successful when you land on the field. Um, and, and so I think if you're starting out, um, you've got to get as much knowledge into your head. You've got to realize that it may be two to three years before you get that first job as a penetration tester. And so whether you go to college or not is really irrelevant. You still got to go out there and you've got to get the degree or no, excuse, not to get the degree get the cert, work on the labs, work on building your, your knowledge set up so that you can get that first job. I want to I want to make that really clear. You're not going to be able to say one day, I want to be an ethical hacker and therefore go out and get you a junior level ethical hacker job. You're going to have to put in a year, two or three, get, you know, an, an INE, eLearn Security, um, you know, certification, you know, potentially start looking at your OSCP start to build out your uh, uh, your extracurricular activities, whether it's your home lab, whether it's working on try hack me's or hack the boxes, um, uh, participating in CTFs. But if I saw a resume today, and here's what I tell folks all the time, if, if I'm hiring for a pen tester job, and I saw and I had a, a junior pen tester on my team or a pen tester level one on my team, and I saw um, an, an I and E eLearn security degree, and then nothing else but hands-on, hack the box, try hack me, CTF time, home labs on a resume, I'd hire that kid in a heartbeat. Absolutely 100%. Um, because it's the hands-on stuff that isn't being taught outside of just a handful of certifications you know, that are going on out there. I think, I mean, that's, that's great advice. I mean, it's if I was hiring someone for a network position, it's the same thing. You want to you have examples of knowledge and of work and hands-on is always going to be much better so i'm going to push you on this now so forgive go me. for it so the ejpt from ine that's are you saying that's the first certification that you would recommend someone would get or would it be like ceh or what about like CompTIA security plus what would you suggest i mean this is your opinion so what would yeah. you suggest me to go and do if i want to break into this field 
Um, and again, my opinion, I, I think I think EJPT, um, most people can do EJPT. What I would even say is, is INE offers their PTS or their pen testing student, which is really kind of the the super entry level. It's almost the C, you know, I don't want to I don't want to degrade the PTS by saying it's the CEH of the, the career field. But, you know, they've recognized that that there's a need to have a, a truly entry level you know, you know, certification that's completely free. You can go to the INE website today. You can sign up and you can take the PTS um, completely and totally free um, from from INE. Um, that's right. Yeah, and so that 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 gets you, you know, kind of to your point, the the SEC plus, the the net plus, the the CEH kind of fu fundamentals foundational. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, you know, then after that, you can graduate up into like the EJPT which then helps you start to build on top of that foundation and continue to grow up from there. But there's there's no reason why you have to go take a CEH and pay for that course when there's content out there, especially through I and E, that you can take without a um, you know without paying for. And I mean, is 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 that as well known in the industry? So if if the, I mean, we spoke about gatekeepers and recruiters. Yeah. I mean, that's normally the big problem. If if you do a search on a job website, um, will recruiters be looking for that cert, or they're actually going to be looking for CEH or something else? Uh, so so that's that's the tricky part. Most recruiters are gonna are going to be looking for CEH um, because that's what they know. Um, what what I get, I, I have to I have to table myself on this because I, I can go on a high horse about bashing HR and I've, I've we've had, no, 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 we've, had I mean, it, we've had we've had several recruiters on stream and we have gone on tangents on bashing HR because <laughs> HR doesn't know a, HR doesn't know the difference between CEH EJPT or anything else what the, what's what HR does is HR asks the hiring manager what are you looking for yeah that's why people jump straight into OSCP is because most hiring managers say well I know OSCP, so OSCP is the bar to entry. But quite honestly, if they make it to HR, because there's so few pen testers, just the sheer process of um, you know getting to HR, most HR folks will either have a conversation with you so that you can come to an interview and say, well, no, I don't have CEH, but I have EJPT, PTS, and all of these other things. And the recruiter doesn't know enough. He just says, well, this looks good enough and I need to fill this rec. And so they're going to pass your rec on over to the hiring manager anyway. And so I hate to be a little flippant and a little little cynical about that, but um, well, it's, it, this technical audience. So be as be as real as you can. So I mean, <laughs> you, if you have to swear at HR, that's fine. Because um, <laughs> let's be honest, we're trying to help every, all the viewers here try and you know break in. So tell us, don't don't mince your words, as they say. Tell us exactly <laughs> what do I need to do to get past these these guys, and I'm yeah, sure there'll, yeah. there'll be a lot of comments about HR. <laughs> How do I get past these wonderful people? These wonderful human resources. <laughs> to, to, to get that job. And I mean, I'm really glad, you know, that you've had all this experience with the military. Um, we need to talk about NSA, because that's very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. We need to talk about like corporate, but yeah. for the if I want to break into this field, I mean, I might want to go and work for, for a corporate first and then perhaps later go to the NSA or, or military or go to right. a team. But tell me, how do I do this? Give, give, me, okay. give, me, the, give me the path. And, 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 here's, and here, are, here are Neil's top three things. Neil's top three things are go to i &E, get in the ecosystem, start to take the, the stuff that's available to you that's on i &E. they get They've got IT essentials that you can take. They've got... Uh, you know, a, a pen testing essentials. They've got a networking essentials. They've got a lot of foundational level course, a lot of fundamental courses. And that's free, yeah? And that's free um, that, that you can go and you can take that will help you build up a good basis set of knowledge. From there, I would then advise you to continue your certification or your degree journey, whatever your heart's content is. And if that means go to EJPT next, if that means go to OSCP next, if that means go to any of the blue team certifications or blue team ranges like Cyber Blue Range or something like that and get some of the hands-on skill there, proceed down that route. But at the same time, you should be doing the hands-on piece. And this is where the hack the boxes, the try hack me's, the CTF times, um, all of these uh, put your hands-on um, um, mechanisms come into play and document that hands-on mechanism because I can tell you the HR folks and hiring managers are looking for that hands-on mechanisms in their new entry, um, in, in their junior level folks. And then the third thing, the thing that you can't, um, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to find at any organization. This is something that you've got to do yourself. You have to network. I can tell you that most of the jobs, entry level to senior level, 
um, that happen in the cybersecurity industry come with you networking. And I can tell you that I've had people reach out to me on LinkedIn and, uh, and, 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 you know, I've welcomed them into the community. I'm like, Hey, I see that you're, I, I actually have a, a campaign where I go out and I look for people who are brand new to cybersecurity and I invite them into my LinkedIn network to try to help provide them with mentoring. And, you know, oftentimes their idea of mentoring is they simply send me a message and like, Hey, I'm two years from graduating. Can you help me find a job? <laughs> 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 That's not networking. That's not networking. This industry is so close knit that most people know each other. Most people, when they're looking for stuff, you pick up the phone and you call a friend or you call a CISO or you call another red team operator or you call another penetration tester and you say, hey, I need a pen tester for this or I need a, I'm looking for a, an analyst for that. And so you have to build up that network and you have to participate. You truly have to embrace that about our industry. And those are the three things that I would say that if you're looking to break into this, that's your 2021 and your 2022 strategy um, is is to focus on those things. I think if you're if you're on LinkedIn and you don't have um, you know a thousand a thousand followers in the cybersecurity industry by the end of 2021, you're behind on the networking curve. So I'm I'm really glad because now you've changed the title of this video because I was going to talk <laughs> about five top certifications, but now we're going to call it the top three things to break into this industry or something like that. So can you just repeat that again so that it's ex ex that it's clear for everyone? Absolutely. What are the top three things they need to do? So, so Neil's top three things that they need to do to get into cybersecurity. Uh, uh, first and foremost, you need to go to you know INE's uh, uh, INE's website and you need to sign up for the the available training that's there for free. That that'll get you the basics for uh, IT essentials. It'll get you the basics for some networking essentials. It'll get you the basics for some penetration testing essentials. Don't waste your money on CEH. Don't waste your money on on Sec Plus. Um, instead, go to INE training and, and start there. Once you're done with that, you need to go out there and you need to look for the hands-on training that's available um, for, for free or for cheap. And that would be things like Hack the Box, Try Hack Me, uh, ctftime.org, which is a, a website that aggregates uh, capture the flags. Inside I'll, put, I'll put a whole bunch of links below. So if you can yeah. send me those after the call, that'd be great. Absolutely. Uh, Cyber Blue Range, all this stuff. Get you some hands-on experience. Build yourself a home lab. Um, start doing uh, uh, your, your your own you know stuff at home that you can do pretty easily. There's there's tons of things out there that you can do on yourself. So that's two things. The third thing is you need to network. If you are not on LinkedIn, you need to be on LinkedIn. You need to have a profile that is indicative of what you want to do in this professional world, and it needs to start to look like your digital resume. And you need to treat your LinkedIn profile like your digital resume. And then you need to start networking with folks in this industry. And I'll tell you right now, you can network with me. I'm sure you can network with David definitely, on LinkedIn. Definitely, yeah. We'd be, we'd love to have you. And 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 then just start, you know, you know, reaching out to folks that you know, reaching out to, um, you know, folks inside the company that you work for. Just start building that network. Start small, but build that network out. Um, in this industry, and, and my goal for you, my goal for anybody who's listening is get you a thousand connections in LinkedIn in a year. In 2021, um, there's no reason why you can't make a, a thousand connections in 2021. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this, you can do, uh, I think it's it's 72 connections a day on LinkedIn is the max that you can do before LinkedIn starts to raise a red flag. I know because I've, I've, I've kind of tested that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so there's no reason why you can't get you a thousand solid connections by the end of 2021. And if you focus hard on the cybersecurity industry, then when you've done all of the other two things, you'll have a network of folks that would die to help you find a job in this industry. It's great advice. So now I'm gonna play devil's advocate, as they say, I'm gonna push it, <laughs> so forgive me. Okay, so second thing you said is, you know, we're gonna try hack hack the box, we're gonna try these things. Um, how do I document what I've done? So like you said, you document what you've done, but now explain to me, you know, different websites, how do I actually document what I've done? Absolutely. No, fantastic. And, and I've talked about this on my stream before uh, in the past as well. We've had recruiters on stream that have have, have helped back this up, right? And, and when you look at a, a person who's come into this career field, if, if to your point, right, you're the 17-year-old who's trying to decide how to get into this career field, you don't have a whole lot on your resume, right? If you think about yeah. a eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, you or, don't have or a whole I, lot. Or, or I'm 30 and I've been doing <laughs> building or a, I've been a salesman or whatever, you know, how do I break in? Yeah, yeah, you don't you don't have you don't have a lot of that cyber experience that you can put yeah. on that eight and a half by eleven. 
Um, and, and so when you look at that real estate, people oftentimes fill it up with a lot of like, you know, uh, you know, clickbaity type stuff or yeah. word jargon where they're like, I know, I know Windows 3.1, Windows NT, <laughs> Windows 95, Windows showing, XP, Windows 2008. Just showing your age. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, they, they try to put all that stuff in there to try to get through the computer filters. And I tell people, when I mentor people, I tell people strip all that stuff out of your resume. Take all of that stuff out of your resume. What your resume can have instead is the the hack the box, the CTFs, the try hack me um, uh, website stuff. You can document those as experiences on your resume the same way you would as if you actually did a job where you did those things. So if you achieve level 9000 for, for folks who are used to the, the Dragon Ball Z 9000 reference, you know, if you achieved level 9,000 in Try Hack Me by the time you, you started to, to to look for your first pen testing job, you should document, I am in the top 10% or I'm in the top 1% of all people on the, the Try Hack Me leaderboard. Um, I've achieved level 9,000 on Try Hack Me. I've, um, I, I've completed 4,000 challenges in Hack the Box. I've gone to, you know, t 16 Capture the Flag events this year and placed in the top five and half of them. Right, there are things that you can put on your resume that show your outreach that I think have gone completely unnoticed by by you know folks who are trying to get into this industry. So I mean, this is great because I come from originally from a networking background, and it's very difficult to prove experience in a networking background. But what you're saying to people here is, even if they're doing this part time, so they they're in sales or they in some kind of a job that's totally different, is this a way? that you're saying to build up experience without actually being in this industry is that kind of what we're doing a hundred percent when you right. look at some of the when you look at some of the the entities that are coming up out there um you know that are doing a lot of these labs online cyber cyber blue range uh try hack me hack the box um even all the cts that are out there even this year 2020 was an unprecedented year with the pandemic but it was the first year that DEF CON uh, had done all of their capture the flags 100% virtual as part of DEF CON safe mode. And so this was a year where you could have participated in the DEF CON capture the flags um, and documented that and shown that as experience. And you didn't have to pay a dime for DEF CON this year. Um, and, and so it would have been something that you could have put that on your on your experience where you participated in the DEF CON CTF and you did whatever else it is. Those are things that show that you're not just trying to get a cert, get a job, yeah. which is typically what we see in this industry. You're trying to get a cert, you're learning on your own, you're showing the passion for it, you're showing your ability to think outside of the certification bubble, and that is what hiring managers are looking for. I mean, I just wanna emphasize this. I mean, this is a roadmap for someone to get experience with, without actually having a full-time job, and I think that's fantastic, because that's very difficult to do in other sort of IT spheres. You know, how do you prove that you've got networking experience if you're not working on corporate networks? But what you're saying here is this is kind of a roadmap to get the relevant experience that someone like you would would use to hire someone uh, without actually working full time. So I, I need to push you on this now. So if, if I was applying, well, let, let, I'm, I'm, let's, let's assume I'm 17 or 30, it doesn't matter, but I, I'm new to this industry. I, you, I want to get a job with you. You, 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 you. You're recruiting for a corporate position or for the NSA or whatever. But let's start with corporate. Um, are you saying that you would hire me if I had just a f some basic certifications or none, but I could prove a whole bunch of experience with Hack the Box and all the others? Are you, are you saying that's that that's enough, or, if, or what do you say? If we're if we're stipulating that I have an open job rec for penetration tester on my team and I needed a penetration tester on my team, would I hire somebody who was brand new to the career field, who had a cert and a ton of hands-on experience that was demonst demonstrable inside the industry? 100%, I would do that today. I mean, that's, that's fantastic because it, it's, it sounds like what you're giving everyone who's watching is a way to break in without making the mistake. And I think a lot of people make this mistake. They think they have to leave their job and be unemployed to get a degree or get a cert before they can actually break in. That's absolutely not the case. I, I, I am vehemently opposed to that. Yeah. I think I think this is one of the, cybersecurity is an amazing industry and it's it's an industry that that was born in technology, not to say that that IT you know networking was not born in technology, but born with some people who are like, I want to practice breaking into systems. It is illegal to break into a system without permission. How do I actually practice breaking into a system? And we as a community have built companies. 
We've built, you know, free freemium versions of things. We've built entire ecosystems that have challenged the community and been able to provide the community with the ability to practice not only breaking into systems in a legal, ethical, safe fashion that allows you to have fun and show your experience doing it, but also to defend systems and be able to hunt for bad, bad stuff inside of a network and be able to practice the network defense side of things in a safe, easy to, to accomplish uh, a type of, uh, of hands-on, almost OJT without actually having the job type training. Um, and, and, and there's no need to your point, David, quit your job, think about going back to school for, for two to four years, you know, commit yourself to, you know, I, I, I to, to the, to the bane of trying to get, you know, 7,000 search just to get an entry level, you know, penetration tester job that, that, that's just, that's not what this industry is about. I'm really glad you said that because it's, um, it's always a problem. How do I get in? How do I get experience without a job to give me experience? And you've basically given us the roadmap for that. Yes. So next thing, how do I network? Because you said it's important to network. So um, tell me, you know, I'm a very pragmatic person. Tell me, how would you suggest networking? You mentioned updating LinkedIn profile, yeah? Yes. And, and then like sending you a connection request. Any other tips to you know, sort of network in this community? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, um, you know, I, 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 and I want to, I want to preface something on networking. I think the, the, the younger generation, you know, if we use your 17 year, 30 year old example, right. I think, I think the younger generation has it easier on the networking side than the older generation, like, like myself and yourself. Right. I think, I think when I talk to folks who have been accountants or lawyers or construction workers that want to get into cybersecurity, they have a harder time with the, the LinkedIn story and the networking side of it than, than the younger generation does. So, so I think the younger generation knows how to use social media. But one of the things that I want to focus everybody in on is when you look at social media, um, when you look at LinkedIn, when you looked at Twitter, um, you know, really focus in on, um, you know, what your goals and objectives are with that, that platform, right? LinkedIn is a platform of professional people. And so your picture needs to be not you playing at the beer pong table. It needs to be, you know, you know, you look nice, have a, have a nice shirt on, look kind of professional, um, you know, and then when you when you talk about yourself, you you highlight your successes. Um, you're a student at XYZ University or you're 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 a graduate. Use the headlines to your advantage. Hey, I'm looking for my first cybersecurity job. Um, talk right. about the things that you've done. You know, really use that as a platform to to highlight, you know, that you're capable and qualified um, to, to be in this field. And then when you do that, um, you can participate in groups on LinkedIn. You can engage in, in, in other folks. When you see me post something, we see David post something. When you see somebody you follow post something that's cybersecurity related, take an active effort um, to, to comment and to interact and engage in those posts so that people are used to seeing your name. Um, if, if your viewers, uh, this, this may not be an influencer that, that you know many of your viewers uh, may be familiar with, may not be familiar with, but there, there's a US business person called Gary Vaynerchuk. Oh, yeah. um, I think he's very well known. Yeah. Okay, good. Just making sure. <laughs> I, I was kind of kind of cynical there for that one, but no, no, go for it. If um, if if you're not following Gary V, you should definitely follow Gary V because he's kind of kind of his uh, his uh, his strategy when it comes to to growing your following on uh, on on LinkedIn or Twitter, and he talks about you know find you know six people who are who are in your industry, um, comment on all six of their posts every single time that they uh, that, that they make a comment. Um, those types of interactions show that you want to be in this community. You're not just here for the bells and whistles because it looks cool, because ethical hacking is the the, the new sexy, but you're getting people to see your opinion, um, You know, thank them for their experience if you want to, or say, this is interesting, I never thought about this, or if there's something that you do have an opinion on, like the solar winds thing that just happened last month or the fire eye um, you know, incident that happened last month, if you have an opinion on those things, voice your opinion, let people know your stance. Let people know what you've researched on the matter, right? When you've gone out there and read up on it, um, you know, really treat those as interactive platforms. And that's that engagement right there will draw people to you and will let them know that you're you're active and you're interested in this community. That's great advice. I never thought I'd, I'd hear Gary V on, on a call <laughs> like this, but it's it, it but it's there's no better person to follow. Yeah on social media or how to use social media. And I mean, I'll, I'll second that. I mean, it's exactly that. As Neil said, if you if you wanna learn how to be good at social media, look at what he does. He's, mm -hmm. And he's got a good, he's got a few good books as well. Um, so you've mentioned LinkedIn and you've mentioned Twitter. Are there any other sort of social media platforms that you would suggest someone join and 
get heavily involved in? Um, for, for the sole purpose of networking and cybersecurity, not necessarily. Um, I think I think those two are really the, kind of the primary vectors that InfoSec uses to, to do communication. Um, you know, discords are, you know, I, I hate to, I hate to talk about discords being a dime a dozen, but discords are a dime a dozen out there. There's everybody, almost everybody and their brothers got a discord out there. Um, discords can be a little bit of a sea of, you know, how do I find the right people? If you've got the emotional bandwidth and the mental, you know, fortitude to, to, to trove through discords, I would definitely encourage that. And then obviously Reddit is, is sometimes kind of like, you know, the, the, the overly cynical version of social media, but there's there's some really good subreddits that are out there that that I think are, are worth, you know, perusing through. But I think the majority of InfoSec relies heavily on, on Twitter for their primary social communication with their peers, but LinkedIn is your digital resume. And so you need to make sure that your your digital persona of your professional image is is solid on LinkedIn and then your engagement is is active over on Twitter. Okay, so going back to the first one, because I, I, I want to push you on this. Start with some INE free certs, free training. Mm -hmm. And um, if I had to get one certification to open the door, it would be OSCP, is that right? Uh, as of right now, I think I think OSCP is, is the easiest one to get past the gatekeepers, um, you know, that's out there. Um, I, I think we'll see that change. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I know this is a longer answer. I usually do yes or no's, uh, for, for questions like no, this. That's, this great. that's great. No, go for it. Um, I, I think, I think we'll see that change. Um, SANS is starting to price itself out of the industry. I've seen so many comments on, on, in the Twitterverse and, and on LinkedIn and on my peer group, um, and, and having run security operations teams, I can tell you that paying over $7,000 per person on top of travel and expenses kind of pre-COVID, um, it, it, cr it crushes your training budget. It crushes yeah. your training budget. And and so I think the I think the tides are shifting. And and while I think OSCP was the gold standard, I think I and E um, you know, is going to surpass them if they haven't already just in terms of that name name recognition. I mean that's great. I mean it's I think we've got a, a great roadmap, three things that someone can do very practically. And I think the most important piece that you've mentioned is the is the second part, which is get practical experience in your spare time. Um, you don't have to, you know, leave your job, get this on the side and then build up that experience. And then as you make more and more connections, and that's a great challenge that, that you gave, you know, get a thousand uh, followers or, or contacts um, on LinkedIn, make a, a thousand. I, I've hit 30,000. So apologies to everyone who sends me a connection <laughs> on LinkedIn. I can't accept it anymore because they limit it at 30,000. It's terrible. <laughs> Same on Facebook. I mean, I can't take Facebook friends because I've hit 5,000. It's, it's, oh, wow. I can't take any more. But um, <laughs> it, it's amazing. I, so I want to talk about that briefly is and, and see if you if you agree with me. I used to hate social media and I used to you know, think I need to keep everything private. But as soon as I started engaging with social media, as soon as I started using it, the doors started opening. And mm -hmm. it, have you had the same experience? I, I have. And, and when I started my LinkedIn, I was in the military and I had a, a top secret security clearance and I was doing, you know, cyber work in, in, in the military. And, you know, that was the very paranoid OPSEC days, operational security days in the military. But, but I took a stance that was like, you know, I'm going to control what I put onto social media so that the image that the social world sees of me is the image that I want social people to see with, see of me. And w especially when you take that persona on LinkedIn and you realize that your LinkedIn is what your boss, your future boss is going to look at, your future peers are going to look at, people who are trying to evaluate whether they're going to hire you or not in the recruiting space. When recruiters are out there looking for you, when you realize that that's your audience on LinkedIn, you want that to be a, a digital resume, a testament to how awesome you are in this space, whether you're whether you're just starting out or whether you've been in this space for 20 years, you want that digital footprint to look like that. Um, I can tell you that um, since I've been out of the military, since we're on the LinkedIn topic, um, I think I've gotten um, uh, two jobs since I've been out of the military um, by actually looking for a job on a job board and sending out a resume and applying for it. And that was the first job I had when I got out of the military in, in 2013 and the job that I had immediately after that. Those two jobs were the only two jobs that I've actually ever sent out a resume for that applied for. Everything else has come from recruiters reaching out to me, 
has come from, you know, your know, partners at a big four reaching out to me, CISOs uh, at other companies reaching out to me. Uh, that's how those jobs have come to me is, is reach outs over LinkedIn and not actually by applying for jobs uh, in the space. I mean, it's, it's a great testament. I mean, I know you've taken this to the next level. You've been on TV, is that right? That's right. I, I, I've been on I've been on Bloomberg. So, I mean, they, they were quizzing you about, um, I, I, I didn't see the interview. They were quizzing you about something, I'm assuming some hack or something. Uh, it was and, the SolarWinds hack, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that obviously opens up a huge opportunity for you because if people see you on television, they're going to want to give get you involved in their next project. It's, it's exposure. I, I, it is. It's it's a hundred percent exposure. You you know it's and 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 make no mistake. I, I I feel ridiculously blessed. I don't. I count my blessings every day that that I've been able to grow up and I've been able to be successful in this this industry. But it's it's not. I, I tell people this all the time. Is like it's like you know I have found I found gold and I want to share it with literally right. everybody um, because it, it's not outside the reach. And and I'll I'll tell I'll tell you this. You can cut it in or out if you want to. Um, uh, I I didn't get accepted into college when when I when I graduated high school I got turned down to go into college um, I got my first jobs um, based solely on the fact that I was a 18 year old kid who had you know you know built some of the first web pages for North Carolina State University built some of the first web pages for for Wake County Public School Systems this is back in the 90s when HTML was first kicking off um, I was able to demonstrate for these people that I may not have gone to college. But I, I demonstrated being able to write HTML. I didn't get my degree until the Air Force handed me a degree, um, you know, some number of years ago, um, you know, just because you you did your 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 time in service inside the Air Force, and so I don't yeah. have a deg- I don't I don't have a formal you know collegiate degree, um, and so I I can do it, and I know that everybody else there out there can do it, and I know that that everybody's trying to pro- push degrees and promote degrees because that's the society that we live in, that you have to go to a higher education and you have to go get a degree and you have to be successful. But, but you know, this industry is different than engineering, than accounting, than legal, and all of those others out there, that that's just not true. You think I'm not gonna put that in? That's gonna be right in the beginning. <laughs> Uh, Neil, we, we're running out of time. I mean, this could go on for a long time, and I, I wanted to quiz you about, you know, solar winds and stuff like yeah. that. But you know, we, we've only got a few minutes, so tell me, you 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 did work for the NSA, and I think that's right. that's, that's something a lot of people may aspire to, or may aspire to be on the other side of the fence. But let's not get into that. <laughs> so, so tell me, is the NSA made of supermen and people who are just like out there intelligent <laughs> or is it normal people and you know if i want to start out is that is that is it possible for someone like me to work towards working there uh so, so i'll start with the second question first second question is unequivocally yes 100 percent. the the whether it's whether it's the nsa the fbi um uh cia any any uh, i don't know anybody at gchq but but you know i imagine gchq is obviously looking cyber is huge and the so governments are big, looking big push for in the UK. I'll, I'll just interject that they're trying yeah. to get more and more people involved. Yeah, big push. Yeah, I mean there are there are the governments recognize the value of getting a, a more people who who have come up in this space um, actively involved in offensive security. So yes, the second question is easy. The NSA will, would absolutely hire you without you being a superstar. I don't mean that like you, you shouldn't shun, you shouldn't you shouldn't be a slacker. But you know you don't have to think that you're you know Kevin Mitnick reincarnate to go work at the NSA. Um, trust me when I say you don't have to break the law and get arrested and then go work at the NSA. That's not a career path. That's, That's not, not a career path. You're not advocating that then. I'm not advocating that. I, I know it's been televised, but that's not a career path. <laughs> um, if you if you do the same things that you would do, like what we're talking about now, the NSA being a government entity, they're going to push you into a four year degree. I think the government is working on trying to figure out how to solve that problem um, on the U.S. side. That's something that you know, unfortunately, you may have to fight the system when it comes to doing something like that. Uh, you know, we're still not that mature as a cybersecurity industry. Now, to your first question, there are some crazy, crazy smart people uh, that that work there. There is a um, um, there is a there's a team of folks, um, and 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 when I was there, it was a, it was a couple hundred folks who who do all of the exploit development, tool development, capability development. Um, you know, you know, D and T, you know, was was the name of it when I was there. Who who does all of the the 
things that you read about or the things that you dream about or even yeah. some of the the crazy stuff that you see in TVs yeah. that's that team and and these are probably some of, especially on the crypto side not not so much on the hacking side but especially on the math and crypto side these are some guys who um if you ever seen the movie um Rising Mercury with uh, Bruce Willis and the kid and you've got this kid who's got autism but he looks at a page and can figure out that it's like the most complicated cryptographic algorithm out there and he can break it just by looking at it yeah. they have people like that who as soon as they turn the legal age of 18 the nsa pluck them right out and put them into a building with no windows uh fluorescent lights and a drop ceiling and that's where they've spent the last 10 to 15 years of their life and so yes they are ridiculously smart and ridiculously weird all at the same time <laughs> Now, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry, everyone, we're running out of time. Neil's got another meeting in a few minutes. So, Neil, I'm afraid I'm going to have to, like, twist your arm and get you back because I, <laughs> I want to twist your arm to talk about solar winds. Yeah. And could I ask everyone to put comments below, you know, what would you like Neil to talk about on another another video? Um, and should we do a live? I think he's, he's big on Twitch, but I want to get him on, on the channel as well. Neil, I really want to thank you for your time. I mean, um, please mention your your social media accounts again for everyone so they can follow you. I'll put them below as well. And any any closing words? No, David, thank you so very much for having me. It's a, it's an honor to, to be with somebody like yourself. Your, your videos are amazing. The, the content you put out is is, is really awesome. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to the opportunity to, to, to be part of this. I uh, would welcome the opportunity to, to, to come back on and, and, and do another and talk to your audience. Um, for those who are looking for me, uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, at IT Junkie, uh, all one word. You can find me on LinkedIn under Neil Bridges, um, or you can find me on Twitch every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time in the U.S. at Cyber Insecurity, uh, Cyber underscore I N Security. Um, and and it, uh, it's a, just to give a little brief on that, it's a little play on some of the imposter syndrome um, that is inherent inside the cybersecurity industry to let you know that. You know, anybody out there who's listening to this, imposter syndrome isn't just related to, to you because you're new in the industry or anything like that. I can tell you that I've been in this industry for 20 years um, I, and I can I can cite instances as recently as a few months ago where I've had my own cases of imposter syndrome. And so happens to um, us all. Happens it to happens all. to us all. And so so come join a community where we try to break down those barriers. We talk about all aspects of cybersecurity and, and you're welcome in a group of people that just want to see you you grow and be the best version of yourself inside this industry that you can be. Neil, I really appreciate, appreciate that, man. That's fantastic. Speak to you later. Cheers. Absolutely. Cheers, sir.